when will I get my vaccine? That is the question on everybody's lips right now. And people are concerned, it has to be said, at the slow pace of the vaccine rollout. And the worry is that this delay will see lockdown being extended. Staying with COVID, the mandatory quarantine legislation has now been signed into law and it's expected that the new system will be up and running very soon. Could it be that the scandal hit Davy is about to be purchased by Bank of Ireland? It's up for sale, as you probably know. Bank of Ireland, that's a bank that we still have a 14% shareholding in, by the way. Fancy a flutter on the stocks and shares. From stocks and shares to insurance companies, and insurance companies across the country have poured cold water on the prospects of premiums being cut with immediate effect, despite judges approving substantial reductions to court awards last weekend. For example, payouts for whiplash will be more than halved under the new system, but we, the poor consumers, won't see any savings, any major savings for a while yet. And and last week, at this very moment, or at this very time last week, I swore, did I not, that there would be no talk of kings and queens and princes and princesses on this show. But that interview, that interview changed everything, didn't it? Our panel this morning, Nessa Cosgrove, is the local Labour Party representative in the Sligo, Leitrim, South Donegal, North Roscommon constituency. Johnny Fallon is a director with Car Communications, well-known political analyst and commentator. And Louise Heaven is a Green Party councillor based in Westmeath. Thank you all for being with us today. Louise, we'll start with you. Uh, the rollout of the COVID vaccine proof once again, is it not? That in the EU, in the EU family, we are small fry. We are the poor relation. And therefore, we will be left waiting for the vaccine. Good morning, Joe. Um, I mean, I know this morning and probably over the past number of weeks and months, people have been frustrated, undoubtedly, with the vaccine rollout. But... Um, the good news is we have vaccine and, uh, you know, I have family members who and many people around here have people who are at risk who are getting the vaccine or working in healthcare who are getting the vaccine. And yes, they can be frustrated with the slow pace, especially because our nearest neighbours are, you know, one of the top countries in the world for rolling out the vaccine. But it is happening and we need to keep the faith and keep strong and, and say, you know, we are we are fighting our corner. You know, we are making those phone calls. And, um, you know, this is a global effort. And it's not just about, you know, which countries does what. It's about, you know, the pharmacy companies. How are they getting the shipments to us? Um, how quickly it's happening in third world countries? You know, that's very important. It's what the um, things like, Gavi and, and other um, aid agencies, how are they, you know, getting vaccines to the people who really, really need it in overcrowding, overcrowded conditions? Like, we need to think not just about me, when will I get my vaccine? We need to think about the world and how we're going to stop this virus and how we're going to stop the variants and how we're we going to protect the most vulnerable and the people who are at risk of dying. All right, but Johnny Fallon... It is about parity of esteem within this EU family. I mean, all this week I've heard on the show we were treated terribly back in 2008. They walked all over us because we were that small dot in the ocean. And now people are convinced they're doing it again. We heard last night politicians are helpless. In fairness, even the opposition are conceding that they cannot point the finger of blame at the Taoiseach and the minister. We have multinationals here who seem to be delivering for the larger countries and we're losing out. That's true, Joe. I think it's, it's, a, it's a fair assessment uh, in how it's gone. I don't think the EU has covered themselves in glory uh, in how they handled the contracts and how they approached it. Um, and, and that's disappointing. It certainly is disappointing for a country like Ireland where you tend to rely on the likes of the EU having the expertise here. It's, it's been one of their darker, darker times and, and I think a lot of lessons uh, need to be learned at the EU level uh, about this. It is essentially a problem with supply. Um, 
And there is that patience, yes, we're getting it rolled out. At the same time, the United States, the EU, Britain, you know, you're looking at major countries and saying, why haven't you already come together and met with these multinationals at an international conference? Why aren't you doing this on a global scale? If it is that kind of rollout, what's needed? What's the problem? How do you solve it? Again, if this was a war, and we've been told time and time it's a war, internationally, they'd be meeting to discuss it. But because it's something like vaccines that actually are saving lives, we don't have that same urgency at international level. And then at Irish level, I don't think we're blameless. I think from the the public's point of view, it's been a, a really frustrating process to watch. We have to wait for the vaccines to come out. At the same time, we're not exactly seeing doctors, GPs, nurses, health workers waiting, standing around, waiting for the vaccine to come in. So it's not like, you know, I think the public kind of feel well, we're not seeing that this vaccine is coming in and being doled out as hard and as fast as it can be. We're seeing kind of, we're going with the pace of supply. We're not exactly ramped up and ready, even if supply did come in. And then I think you have the, the situation and just the comms of it that, uh, you know, during the week you had the Minister for Health saying, well, I'm going to ask the department to look at whether we could could ask for more vaccines. And a day later, the Taunish and the Taoiseach come out and say, oh, we have been asking for the vaccines. We just didn't tell anybody we were asking for the vaccines. But we've been doing that. It just hasn't been any luck because there are no vaccines out there. So the here we go again, a, communication, yeah, a communications problem again. But Nessa Cosgrove, the problem is government policy is linked to a successful vaccination program. In other words, their coming out policy, that's what I'm calling it now, coming out of lockdown, is linked to a successful vaccine rollout. And what people are saying now is, with the way it's going, we could still be in lockdown come Christmas. And that is not an exaggeration on my part, by the way. No, I, um, hi Joe, I don't, um, I agree that it is the way that we're, you know, the back, more back people are vaccinated, obviously, the more people that are able to go out and about. But it's not just that. I suppose the government has to concentrate on rapid testing and being aggressive about when there is outbreaks in the community to find where they are and to, I suppose, get rid of them, to diminish them quickly. So it's about antigen testing as well. They need to up the scale of that and up the scale of contact tracing. I don't think vaccine is, they're going to work together, obviously. Um, and just going back to supply, I suppose I would put a lot of the, you know, AstraZeneca have definitely reneged, or they've like they've reneged on their contract. I suppose they, I mean, they didn't honour their contract that we've had, and that the EU have had yeah. um, in in the supply, and they have, and they're kind of getting away with it a bit. So I, I heard Johnny saying, oh, they're they getting away be, with it, getting away with it. Sure, they're walking all over us. I mean, yeah, we have this and, thing and now yeah, where suppose, they're saying, yeah, we'll meet with the Taoiseach during the week. But sure, we know what's going to happen. How are you? How are you keeping? Yeah, we'll do our best. Next. You know, that's I know. just the and, way and it I is. Mean, more from the, I mean, I would totally not put it at the feet of the government either. I think it's a, a higher level, EU commission level. But And I agree that Johnny was saying that, you know, that there, maybe there should be a summit on vaccines. You know, that to see that there is, like Louise said as well, that there's full implementation around the world, the developing world, that it's not going to be all of us in the Western world vaccine first, and then the developing world behind us, because it's never going to go then. You know, it's, it's always going to be around because of, because of travel, if international travel opens up. Again, I suppose that mandatory quarantine, what we spoke about there, man, you, I heard you saying in an introduction about mandatory quarantine. Finally, it has been coming in, we've been, and we would push, I suppose, as the Labour Party, we'd be pushing that it's all international travel. And um, that there's monetary quarantine for all international travel rather than the 33 selected county or country. All right. But actually, Louise, you're, and it's one of the main reasons why, because we had a Green Party representative on last week and I decided to go with it again this week, um, because your party leader has responsibility for transport and has a part to play in the whole area of mandatory quarantine, even though I think it's the full remit is with the health minister on this. But we had a funeral in Carrick on Shannon in County Leitrim yesterday. It has been one of the main talking points on this show this morning. And half of those, and that's not an exaggeration once again on my part, who attended, travelled in from the UK, obviously drove onto a ferry over to Belfast, across the border, and down to Carrick and Shannon. And here we are, spending countless hours and huge amounts of money putting a mandatory quarantine system in place, and it's badly needed. The sooner we get it up and running, the better. 
But on, until we also deal with the NI problem, Northern Ireland, it's going to be a futile exercise, is it not? Well, I, I don't agree that it is a futile exercise, actually. I think, you know, we need to start, we need to just limit the numbers. I mean, we could see at Christmas time when uh, Minister Eamon Ryan decided, OK, we're going to stop all flights between Ireland and the UK. You know, that reduced travel, people travelling between Ireland and the UK. Yes, maybe some people went to Northern Ireland and came down again. I mean, you know, that is a problem, but it's not like everybody did that. You know, and lots of people, and I... you know, So I'm it only takes one. I'm, it only yes. takes one super spreader. That's all it takes. I, I appreciate that, but at least we don't have 10. You know, th these are the kind of things we need to look at and have been looking at. And yes, there is a border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and that does need to be carefully considered. And the trans transfer of people through Northern Ireland needs to be considered. The same In the same way that we're looking at, let's say, the transfer of people from certain parts of the world through Portugal into Ireland, and, and that may need mandatory quarantine because of their... First initial, um, you know, departure destination or departure location. You know, so they're all things that need to be considered. But I, I don't think we should be like blaming. You know, I don't think we should be start starting to point at sectors of society and saying, "Well, you're at fault. You're at fault. You're at fault." You know, people who are attending these large funerals. Yes, they are being condemned by people. The well, it's not only large funerals, and you're right. We shouldn't be pointing fingers. It's not only large funerals. These are the journeys that are being made that we know of. What about all the journeys that are being made that we don't know of? Nessa Cosgrove, for example, in your constituency, your constituency colleague, Mark McShay, from another party, Fianna Fáil, I hasten to add, he has called for a stronger security presence on the border. He believes that you can't be serious about, you know, sealing off the country or closing down the country until that happens. Your constituency is a border constituency. Are you with him on that policy? Uh, well, I suppose uh, the Labour Party leader actually came out and said that a couple of months ago, Alan Kelly, um, to say about having checks five kilometres from the border. Um, I am in agreement with it. Yeah, I just think that I just think the whole All Ireland approach hasn't really worked. You know that there doesn't seem to be. They're not trying hard enough, maybe, to make it. And this is both sides, you know, and I, not trying hard enough to make it that there is a one island approach. Um, it doesn't make any sense that people can come in, you know, from Northern Ireland and come in, no problem over here. So there has to be something done, you know, so I would agree. And I, I think Alan Kelly was pretty ahead of the ball there when he said that. Johnny Fallon, you live in County Longford. The numbers have been quite high in Longford over the last 10 days. They're rising in Roscommon as well. We've had high numbers in Cavan and Monaghan. Not as high now, thankfully, over the last number of weeks. But only last night, the national figure, the national numbers are rising. And while this is happening, people are travelling in through Belfast. Yeah, that's true, Joe. Um, and I suppose, look, there's, there's the question here too, though, as to, to what is, you know, what resources are you allocating to do what tasks? I mean, equally, when we talk about Northern Ireland, before we had COVID, we spent the last five or six years telling Britain you cannot seal the border of Northern Ireland. You cannot put trade posts there. It's too complex to do. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's saying, oh, let's seal the border with the North and put in checks. It's an unprecedented crisis. Do. But, Johnny, this is unprecedented. This is, you know, a crisis. It's a national, international emergency. It, it, it is absolutely unprecedented, but at the same time, you know, we, we have to deal with certain realities. Uh, you know, we weren't making that up when we said to Britain about Brexit that it is almost impossible to seal that border. What we are seeing is, and I think what, we, what people are not failing, are, are failing to ask the question, why would someone come to Ireland? If we're in lockdown, what the hell is there to do in Ireland? If there's no place to go, if there's no event, if there's no nothing open, why on earth would anybody come into Ireland and visit or go see people when there's absolutely nothing to do? Because so they're coming in, they're coming in for compassionate reasons. We're a compassionate race. That's why they're coming in. And if you go to that one household that you're being compassionate with, 
and that household isn't going out and mixing with other people, then you will control those cases. The problem here is we're talking about seven cases or so coming from international travel in, in, in the last while compared to about 4,000 cases in the community. The fact is what we need to have resources on first and foremost is the funerals shouldn't be happening then we have bishops going out asking for the numbers to be increased at funerals. If funerals are breaching the rules, it simply shouldn't happen. Visiting households, we have to obey these rules at home. It's easy to get obsessed with, oh, it's all international. The facts and the figures show it is not a huge spread from international. There is a danger from international, and we can do that with quarantine. It should happen. We should put all those in place. But priority has to be given to what people are doing while they're here. And that is in the community, and that is all of us who are staying at home, we say, and then on the other hand, we're visiting a few neighbours that we know we get on with, and we're doing a few sleepovers with the kids, and we're doing a few things here and there in breach of the rules, but it's only us and we all know it's okay. And look, at it is tough, and people are fed up with it, and therefore you see people more inclined to break the rules. But ultimately, the problem in Ireland is the fact that the lockdown rules are not being observed across the board by everybody all the time. And until oh. that happens, the numbers aren't going to change. Let's move on. But, can Louise, I that? but I think the numbers have yes, gone away yes. down. You know, so it is working. You know, people are abiding by the rules. Yeah, but I, I, only last night at the Neffet press conference it was stated clearly before we can even consider uh, a process of reopening, we need to get to between somewhere to between zero and 200. And we're nowhere near we, that. Uh, yeah. And the numbers uh, went up again last night and the trend is worrying. That was also stated at last is, night's Neffet press conference. It said but I think that comes down to tracing, to contact tracing. Yeah. Like rapid, yeah. really, like especially when schools are open, they have to have antigen testing available, rapid antigen testing available in schools and to crush it straight away. All right, you know, let's contact, move on. I think that's where the resourcing needs to go into. Right. Rather than pointing the finger at people, I actually think the money, it has, the resources have to go into trade contact tracing and testing. All right. Forty years ago, Louise Heaven, Maura Gagan Quinn gave birth to her son. She was a junior minister in government at the time. I was shocked to, to read last night that during that time, she would travel to Dublin um, travel to work, Leinster House, with her son, her little baby. She was breastfeeding at the time. A neighbour would travel with her to look after the baby while she was doing her work throughout the day. That was 40 years ago, and we still don't have maternity leave entitlements in place for serving ministers and Oireachtas members. I mean, where the hell are we at as a country, you know, when, when we've allowed that to happen? Yeah, you forgot one, Joe. Um, we still don't have maternity leave in place for counsellors either. You know, which, which I learned um, over the summer, I had my son and was in the chamber five days later with him. You know, it is shocking. Like, and, and I think a, a lot of the issue has been or seems to have been the lack of women involved in politics at that level to highlight this as the issue. You know, and, and then there's big questions. Well, and Neve, I Smith, women for Neve, Neve has, Smith and Fairless Louise Heaven, local TD in Cavan Monaghan, 2016, she had her child. She was back at, work two, back at work two weeks later. She had to take a sick cert in order to be at home with her child. And she did do interviews and she did highlight it, but nothing was done. Yeah, yeah. But we are, I mean, thankfully we are seeing that change now and it's entering the, the conversation again and, um, you know, I think it, it needs to happen. I mean, without a doubt, like you have, like I ran for the general election and I didn't get it. But if I had got it and I was having my son, like what would I have done? I don't even know. Like would my whole family have had to move to Dublin, you know, so we can, mm -hmm. we can continue, so I could continue to work and not have maternity leave. I mean, I'm thinking back of it now and how stressed I was even in a counsellor role, which is part time. I was very stressed out trying to take care of a baby and undertake that role you know so it definitely needs to be reviewed across the board and i'm very glad that it ha is being reviewed by the government that what reviewed not. nessa cosgrove here i mean it's a no-brainer i heard last night well it'll go to the citizens assembly and they'll come back and sure we'll talk to them and they'll talk to us what in the name of whoever why do we need to go through this long drawn-out process this needs to be amended now 
No, it does. And that's why there's so few women in politics. I mean, like Louise said, congratulations, Louise, on your baby. And you can imagine, and I know a colleague of mine, Marie Sherlock, as well, bringing the, their babies into the chamber. Like, you're a very brave woman. You know, I said, uh, if I was going back maybe five or six years, they wouldn't be in a position to do that. They wouldn't have been supported at all. So things are changing a bit because of women like Louise, and that they are changing a bit. And fair play to Helen McAtee. You know, she stood her ground and she just put up her case and... You know, it had to be called out that the women rallied around her in the doll as well. That, um, you know, and I, I mean, it is. It, I mean, it's great that she is, and I know they've worked out some agreements so that, that Heather Humphreys is going to step into her role and junior ministers are going to play more of her part. But, like, it's ridiculous. It's actually it's actually mind-boggling that's gone on for so long. And but but there is, I... there's only 36 women out of 160 in the doll. So this is why there, there's not enough women making these decisions. Yeah, and the same uh, happened that there should be legislation that comes in that 50 per 50 percent it should be half and half men and women making these vital decisions that are going to impact in our society. And they think I, we be in this situation. But I wonder, Johnny, do we have to point the finger at the likes of Maura Gagan Quinn, Mary Harney, Mary O'Rourke, Gemma Hussey, I could go on, Francis Fitzgerald and others, in that... I don't know if it was at the top of their priority list when they were in government. Well, I think uh, the problem is, uh, Joe, when you're when you're in government, you require support for any policy, and you know you stick your neck out on something. You have a certain amount of things you're going to stick your neck out on, and a certain, eventually, you know, you're going to get the head chopped off. That's the way politics works. And I think those women uh, that you mentioned, uh, they were in there at a time when they were really in a incredibly male dominated. The fact that they achieved what they achieved was astounding, and and they did huge work. They also were in constituency where a general public were kind of not as appreciative of uh, the, 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 the struggle it was for women uh, at that time in politics and these kind of challenges. But, but there were senior you know, cabinet ministers. Yeah, they were cabinet ministers, but for them to, you know, they were carrying on with their role as minister, and, and there wasn't a huge amount of debate about these things at the same time that would have supported them, nor was there, I think, a lot of support from cabinet colleagues for them to do a run and say, listen, I want to fight for this. But what we do see, and I think you see it again today, as you've highlighted yourself, you know, there aren't enough, there, do, there does need to be a critical mass of women to bring these issues to the fore, because already, as you say, this is something we're going to consider. I mean, it's almost like a shock to politicians uh, at a senior level that women have babies. Women have been having babies since <laughs> humanity began, and now all of a sudden we're trying to figure out how we're going to handle this problem. It's yeah. not complex. It's a solution that this... should be found and sound immediately and without a big discussion about it either. I have this terrible vision in my head of... Uh, well, it's true. We know that behind the scenes, they've been racking their brains for the last three weeks as to how they were going to sort this one out. And I'm just thinking of all the time that has been wasted. This should have been dealt with years ago. Anyway, we're almost out of time. So very briefly, Nessa Cosgrove, who do you believe? Do you believe the Queen and the royal family members? Do you believe Meghan and Harry or do you believe Oprah Winfrey? Uh, I didn't watch us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe I no you. I don't believe I you. I think they're a closed, archaic institution. I have no interest in them. But I would say, though, one thing that I know that came out that Megan said out of us was that she had the power of joining unions. So that's what I would be taking from that, that she said that she, when, she was, when she was working as an actor, that she, if she fell into difficulty, if she needed support, yeah. that the union was behind her. And when she was in the institution, that they were calling it afterwards, the institution, which it is, and that there was no supporter. And I think that I like Oprah Winfrey. Um, I just have no interest really in, in the Royce. Um, but well, sure, none you know, of us I, have. Was, sure, none of us have. But we were still glued to it, or most people were. How about you, Louise? Um, yeah, I think, like, I, I just feel really, um, really upset when I hear about how media, how the media kind of treat people. You know, they never know what, you never know what's going on behind closed doors, you know. And, and the media, I think, need to understand that they have a responsibility to people, you know, to not not detrimentally affect somebody's mental health the way they have been. You know, so I think I, I would say that this whole thing has highlighted um, you know, shining spotlights on specific people um, and following down them down the street when they go into a cafe to have some food, you know, and and posting bits up about them. It's just not on anymore. You know, here, it here. happens to I've got to leave it at that. I've got to leave it at that. But just a quick comment, Johnny, putting your PR hat on you, uh, working with Car Communications, this is what you do. You study these interviews. I take it you will agree with me when I say the only winner here at the end of the day was 
Harpo Productions. Exactly. No winners from the interview. I don't think it went Harry and Meghan's way as regards the, the support they thought they were going to get, and it certainly damaged the royals. I think in particularly William and Kate, as the successors to the throne, have probably been damaged as well. So it's, right. it's a bit like a nuclear bomb. Uh, nothing really survives except the cockroaches, and, and uh, that's the problem for them now. Uh all right, we'll leave it at that. Johnny Fallon from Car Communications, an also well-known political analyst. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Nessa Cosgrove is the Labour Party representative in the Sligo Leitrim, North Roscommon, South Donegal constituency. That's a mouthful. And Louise Heaven is a Green Party councillor on Westmeath County Council.